Welcome to the AFJ Online Hoofcare Classroom. I'm Jeff Cota, Managing Editor of American Ferries Journal. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. We'll begin in a moment, but first let me get a few announcements out of the way. This presentation will run about 30 minutes or so, and after that we'll have a Q&A session. If you look on the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a tab for questions. You could submit questions throughout the webinar and we'll go through as many as possible at the end. If you experience any technical technical issues such as audio or with the display, and I don't interrupt the presenter about the problem, the issue is likely on your end. In case of technical issues, call the Go to, go to Webinar helpline, get a pen or pencil ready and I'll give you a number to call. Uh, they'll be able to troubleshoot your problem and are very quick to respond specific to your machine and internet connection. If you're in the United States, that number is 800-263 6317. If you're in another country, the number is 1 805 617 7000. Again, the US number is 800 263 6317. And outside of the United States, it's 1 805 617 7,000. If the webinar session crashes, re-enter the webinar through the same link that brought you here. If it crashed for all of us, I'll relaunch the session and wait a few minutes for everyone to rejoin, and then we'll pick up where we left off. Sponsoring the webinar is Save Edge, makers of the original horse rasp, as well as the Beast, the Final Touch, and the Photo Finish Rasp. The original rasp has been the industry standard for many years and is known for having a smooth yet aggressive cutting action due to a superior tooth design and precision sharpening process. Save edge rasps are used regularly by professional farriers who demand premium tools that work. There can be only one original, the Save Edge original. For more information, visit SaveEdge.com. So with that, let's begin our webinar. Bob, thanks for joining us and take it away. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining. Um, I hope you get something out of this. I'm trying to do something a little more original than just say this is the coarse side and this is the fine side of a rasp. So thanks again for Save Edge for sponsoring these classrooms and education. It's, it's great that, uh, that we have manufacturers and distributors out there that are interested in, in making us all a better farrier. A, a short history, abrasive instruments have been found in archaeological digs for, for thousands of years, but most of them were, were stones or, or by about 1000 BC, a, a lot of bronze was being used. But it was basically for woodwork uh, because none of the, the, the hardening techniques had been developed. And bronze, of course, is, is quite a bit softer. So they, they have found archaeologically, they have found uh, iron rafts back at 1000 BC. But it wasn't until the Middle Ages, which is before 400 AD to 1400 AD, uh, that blacksmiths started developing the, the idea and the techniques of being able to harden metal. And at that time, they started developing files and rasps that were used on horses' feet and on, on different metal. Um, it's interesting to note that these hardening techniques that were developed by blacksmiths in their particular towns uh, were jealously guarded by the blacksmiths. These techniques were specific to them, specific to their types of metals, and some of the metals that we know today still bear the names of some of the German towns where the blacksmiths uh, had developed the hardening techniques. By about 1400, uh, rasping and filing on metal and horses' feet were relatively common, and the hardening techniques have kind of leaked out to, to most of the world. This is a rasp that was found in Texas in 1890 at an old Calvary uh, uh, fort. Um, it's interesting to note that the design of this rasp in 1890 is pretty much what we use today. Um, this was probably a, a Heller or a Nicholson because those were the only two companies that were making horseshoe and rasp at, at that time, but it's uh, almost identical to today's rasp. Rasp versus files. Files are hardened steel with parallel rows of cutting teeth, and they are either cut or chiseled into the metal. Now, they're single cut files that file in 
one direction and double cut files that will file in two directions, forward and backwards. And most of the files have 36 to 60 teeth per inch and very fine files will have up to 100 teeth per inch. But rasps are formed entirely different. Rasps are formed by a punch that raises the metal up, actually raises the tooth up out of the metal. So the, the term single cut and double cut are inappropriate for rasps because as we all know, a rasp only cuts in one direction. For hundreds of years, this is how rasps were made by hand. Uh, this was a labor intensive job requiring years and years of practice to get to a journeyman level. Uh, and every rasp that you see had each one of those teeth individually raised by using a punch. The problem with handmade rasps is that you didn't have consistency in the teeth. Because they were done by hand, some teeth were raised a little bit higher, some maybe a little bit wider. The spacing between them sometimes became uh, wiggly lines, and therefore you weren't able to get a really clean cut. One tooth would dig in deep, one tooth would dig in shallow, and so you couldn't get a really flat cut. By the 1870s, both Nicholson and Heller had factories uh, on the East Coast, and they were machine making files uh, and rasps. When I was doing some research on files and rasps, I ran across uh, an article that was in a book, and this book is called Hardware in volume 31 of the hardware. It was uh, digitized in 2013 by Google, so you can find it online. And on page 52 of volume 31 is an article on just how a file or a rasp is made in the modern factory of 1905. In that article, it talks about the 30 to 40 hands that had to touch that rasp from the very beginning to where it was finished and distributed. And it's a, it's a fascinating little article. I, I recommend you guys look this thing up. You can just Google hardware volume 31. I think it'll show up or Google just how a file or rasp is made and, and that will show up as well. The modern horse rasp surprisingly looks a lot like that one in, uh, that was found uh, in Texas. Uh, has a body length of 17 inches, including the tang. 14 is the cutting edge. Width is an inch and a three quarters on all the manufacturers. And the teeth are five, six, or eight per row, which we'll talk about uh, why that is. And they have 86 rows, which means 688 teeth that are staggered on the rasp. And you can imagine making those by hand day in and day out. All modern rasps are case hardened. Case hardened is where they take a, a relatively milder steel, not a tool steel, uh, and they build the rasp, and then they go through a case hardening process where the working surface uh, is turned into a carbon steel by what it's put into. This makes the rasp more flexible in the core and less brittle for breaking. If they were to use a piece of tool steel, not only would we be paying a lot more for a rasp, uh, but they would be regularly breaking. So in a, to case harden, you would, you would make a rasp, and then you would heat up to a red heat. Um, and it may be only necessary to, to, to case harden a portion. So gears in, in your cars and other equipment, the teeth are case hardened, but the rest of the gears is a mild steel. So you take the red hot steel and you place it into a high carbon hardening compound, and that's usually a, a powdery powder compound, and let it kind of cool a little. Then the, the steel is reheated up into a red and then quenched in a variety of mediums from water on on. And most of us farriers have been asked by blacksmiths repetitively about old rasps. What brand makes the best kind of knives and what kind of tool steel is it or steel it is so they can quench it properly? And you can't find information about it. Nobody can. The type of steel and the quenching method and the hardening are all proprietary. And none of the rasp companies will share that with anybody. So. It's a crapshoot when you uh, get a variety of used, uh, used rasps. The rasp is the most expensive tool in your shoeing box. And it's that way for a couple of reasons. And one is that it's not used properly. Uh, I know farriers that, that get 10 to 12 horses out of a rasp and then they pick up a new rasp. And I know others that can get 50 horses per rasp and those are the ones that know how to properly take care of a, 
of a rasp. So we're going to give you some, some tips on how to make your rasp last quite a bit longer and go through more horses. First, you need the right rasp for the right job. So a floor rasp. The floor rasp is the rasp you use to trim feet. It never touches metal of any kind. Uh, this is a rasp that can be resharpened uh, several different ways. And we're going to talk about those, those methods. Uh, and, and you can get up to 50 horses out of these rasps if you take proper care of them. The finished rasp, of course, is your clean up the foot and clinches rasp. Um, it shouldn't touch metal very aggressively, just a little lightly on the shoe. And again, this is a rasp that can be resharpened many times and can last quite a bit longer. And of course, the last is the hot rasp, and that works on metal only. Um, and then, of course, after the hot rasp, it becomes a, a variety of all kinds of projects for blacksmiths and farriers. This is a, a mini rasp. This is one of the rasps that we have out there. Um, this is kind of a cool little rasp. It's eight and a half inches long. Overall length is 13 inches because the handle is permanently attached. Um, it's an inch and three eighths wide and has six teeth per row. If you're working on foals or minis or little ponies and you need to one hand it, this is a rasp to do it in. I had a, a couple little ponies I used to trim, a couple little cute little minis. Um, one was named Sparky and the other was named Thumper. And they had little short legs and picking up that front leg and trying to get a full size rasp underneath them to clean them was virtually impossible without poking them. So this, this little uh, rasp works great. And then it turned into being the perfect foal rasp for working those uh, younger foals where you have to hang onto the foot with your hand because you can't lock them between your legs. This is a standard rasp that most of us use every day. It's 14 inches in length, uh, inch and three quarters wide, but they come in five, six, or eight teeth per row. And the manufacturers sometimes are specific to they only make a certain number of teeth and others have several to pick from. And of course, they have one coarse side and uh, one fine side. A lot of the companies are making these oversized rafts now. This is Save Edge the Beast. It comes in 14 inch and 17 inch lengths. and um, it's two and three eighths inches wide, so a little over a half inch wider. Still has eight teeth per row. Great for the warm bloods and uh, for the draft horses. These again, if taken properly care of, you can get a lot of horses if you keep them sharpened. And then the finished rasp, of course, is more like a file. It's uh, fine on one side and extra fine on the other. These really sharpen well. These can last a long, long time if they're kept uh, properly tuned up and cleaned. The correct side, uh, having a horseshoe in school, I can tell you this is a constant battle. Uh, don't use the fine side of your rasp. Now, if you're looking to remove a lot of foot, use the coarse side. You can't change angles and, and uh, change toe length just rasping it. If you're shoeing in a wet environment, you'd like to have a rasp that's got five or six teeth per row with a wider tooth angle. And that keeps the material from clogging up that tooth. Once the tooth gets clogged, the only cutting is being done by the very, very tip of that tooth. And it gets dull pretty quickly by using just the tip and not the entire uh, chisel type tooth. If you're shoeing in a more dry environment, you would like to have uh, uh, like eight teeth per row and they're a narrow tooth angle. It gives you a little better bite because you're not taking as wide of a cut uh, and you can remove the foot with a, with a lot more smoothness and you don't have to worry about your uh, rasp clogging up. Think about horseshoeing rasps like you would think about a hacksaw blade. If I've got a really long pony foot that I'm gonna use a hacksaw blade to cut off, I wanna go to 12, maybe 14 teeth per inch on my hacksaw blade so it doesn't clog up in the soft material. If I've got a really hard piece of metal I need to use a hacksaw on, I'm going to go to 32 or 38 teeth per inch. So it's the same thing with rafts. The more teeth uh, you have in the row, the harder the foot should be that, that you're using that particular rasp on. One of the most important things you can do for your rasp is keep it clean. When the teeth clog up, once again, all you're using is a very tip to cut. 
And by doing that, uh, you're, you're reducing the life of your ASP considerably. Now they sell these little file cards in a lot of the ferrous supply houses. They're just a piece of cloth that's got uh, metal bristles embedded in it, and then they're glued onto a wooden handle. These are great for files. In fact, it's called a file card, but it is not for a horseshoeing rasp. That metal will dull the edges, the cutting edges of your rasp. So what you need to be able to do is you need to keep a nylon or a natural bristle brush handy, and you need to use it often. You need to keep your rasp from clogging up. Protect from dampness. You guys that shoe up in, in a very wet environments know this, how quickly stuff can rust. But even if you're not in a very wet environment, the evening dew inside your truck, the condensation, will attack that really thin, fine cutting edge on your rasp, and they will dull it. So at the end of the day, take your nylon or bristle brush, clean your rasps, and coat them with a light oil, like a WD-40, and keep that little fine edge so it doesn't rust. That rust will attack it so quickly that within a couple of nights, you can take considerably the edge off of a, off your rasp. In addition, you want to protect it from other metal. I can't tell you how many times I have seen farriers walking out into a pasture do a bunch of broodmare trims, and they're carrying their rasp and their nippers in the same hand. That high carbon steel, that tool steel of your nippers are banging into the rasp and knocking off the edge of all the teeth that it touches. And you do this all day long when you've got 10 or 12 horses that you're, that you're uh, cleaning up in a, in a pasture and you carry your rasp like that, that rasp is, has taken 50, 60% of its life gone just in that one day of trim. So protect your floor rasp uh, and finish rasp from touching other metal. Same thing applies in your shoeing box. Don't have the rasp laying around, bouncing around as you're driving down the road, having the cutting edge bang on the reins of your tongs or your nippers or pull-offs. Keep your flooring rasp and your finished rasp completely away from other types of metal. Lots of guys are out working on a horse, they've got a rasp in their hand, they drop the rasp on the ground, use their nippers or knife, pick up the rasp, trim the foot, drop it back on the ground. Those are abrasive environments. And every time you throw that rasp down on the rock or the sand, you're taking off that very, very fine cutting edge that makes for the sharpness of the rasp. And we all know what happens when a rasp gets dull. You can no longer pull it, you start pushing it, you start gouging the foot, you're not getting a nice level foot. So protect that tool and get a quality job. They've got some different um, little sleeves that you can put rasp in that are, that are made by uh, some different companies, little commercially made covers. Or go by your local firehouse. Uh, they're required to do regular inspections of fire hose and they gotta throw away the stuff that's no good. Doesn't take to get a couple feet of this to cover your rasp. The rasp uh, using part is 14 inches long, so you get a 16, 17 inch piece of fire hose and it makes a really good holder uh, for your rasp. Pick it up, head out in the field with it and keep it in the sleeve. Okay, to extend your life of your, of your rasp, perhaps one of the biggest challenges on rasp is nipper control. The better your nipper control is, the more life you'll have with a rasp. A rasp is meant to do nothing but just lightly float a foot after a quality nipper job. It's not meant to remove a lot of foot like we talked about before. So get handy with your nippers. If you've got guys riding in your truck, Put some time on them on making a nice, clean nipper run so that your rasp doesn't have to do any aggressive removing of foot. It just merely floats it to get it nice and flat or to round up an edge. You can dramatically increase the number of horses per rasp just by developing nipper control and getting a nice, clean, flat cut. Clean the foot before rasping. We work in, in stables where they have these big sand arenas. That sand is abrasive, it's a sandpaper. 
before you run your nippers and your rasp on a foot, after you hoof pick it out and knife it a little bit, wire brush it. Get that sand and the rocks and debris out of the white line area so that when you run your nippers across it and then run your rasp across it, you're not getting those stones and sand. Uh, they're going to dull everything. Again, keep your rasp clean. A dull rasp, I mean, a, a clogged rasp dulls quite quickly. So even if you've got to do your rasp, uh, clean the rasp several times a foot in, in inclement weather, it's well worth it. And apply pressure only on the cutting direction. A rasp cuts in one direction. So as you pull the rasp across the foot and then you're sliding it back to cut again, don't put pressure on it. Don't slide it. That won't cut the foot, but it will dull the teeth. And make sure you use all of the rasp. you got 86 rows of rasp. If you're only using 30 of them, you're not getting your money's worth out of a rasp. Now, one of the easiest ways to keep your rasp sharp is to use a buffing wheel. There was a really nice article by Steve Teichman uh, in the journal, and it's up on your screen. You can look that up about how to use uh, the buffing wheel. If you use a buffing wheel in between every horse and you keep your floor rasp sharp, just touched up, you are going to be amazed at how long you use that rasp. You use just a little bit of an abrasive comp compound to, to put it in there and run your rasp across it. It's like a hoof knife. If you wait until your hoof knife is so dull you can't even cut your finger with it, you spend a lot of time and energy trying to sharpen it. But if you touch it up between every horse, you can keep an edge on that knife for weeks. Same thing with your, with your rasp. Run it across this wheel. A new rasp, you might have to just lightly hit it. An older rasp may take five or six passes to put the edge back on it, but it really puts a nice edge uh, on, on your rasp and keeps it on there. Another really good method is with muriatic acid. You can use a sulfuric acid like they use in plumbing. And it's a little more toxic, a little more dangerous. I, I prefer the muriatic acid. Muriatic acid, uh, when diluted with water, becomes harmless and it's biodegradable. Uh, so you don't have to worry about where you're going to do with the residue. You can purchase muriatic acid at uh, all the big box hardware stores. Yeah, you can go in the pool section. They use this to bring the acid level up in your swimming pools. Uh, in the tile section, they use it for cleaning tile. And you can pick up a gallon of it relatively inexpensively. Get a, a three or four inch ABS pipe and buy an end cap that you glue on and then some cap on the top just to uh, keep it preserved. This one I use has just got a little rubber cap on it that I can put back over it and, and keep the air out of it and whatever else falling into it. Before you start to dip your rasp in this stuff, make sure you find a nice place to put this. Uh, I use a couple of cinder, uh, cinder blocks. I stack them on top of each other and I just place this in the hole. They can't be knocked over, can't be spilled, bumped. Then you take, uh, pour this with muriatic acid. It's kind of nasty to breathe, so make sure this is outside and ventilated. Uh, if you splash some on you, uh, rinse immediately with water and it dilutes it right away. Uh, if you get it on your clothes, it'll just be a wet spot today and a couple days later it'll be a hole. Uh, but it's not going to be that corrosive to your skin and always wear safety glasses when you're around any kind of any kind of chemicals like this. So you pour the muriatic acid into your tube and then you stick your rasp in there and leave it overnight. And you'd be surprised at how much this sharpens. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a kind of a, a formula for cold versus uh, warm environments because it, the acid acts differently in different environments. After you've soaked your rasp, pull it out and stick it in a bath full of baking soda. The baking soda will, will dilute the um, acid. Just use a pair of fire tongs. Don't use your fingers. Um, What's, what I found out what happened with muriatic acid is it will eat underneath your fingernails and make them hypersensitive for, for weeks. So use a pair of tongs, pull it out, and run it through this bath of baking soda to neutralize the acid, uh, and then dry it off, run it across the buffer a couple of times, and 
spray it with a, a lubricating WD-40 or some kind of lightweight oil, and you will be amazed at how sharp that rasp becomes. So for every 10 degrees of temperature change outside, you can double the rate of the chemical or reduce the rate of the chemical reaction. So I've got a 90 degree day, I'm probably gonna be able to get my chemical reaction in maybe six, eight hours to sharpen my rasp. If I'm in a 30 degree environment and I've got this sitting in my shop, it may, may have your rasp soaked for 24 hours. You're just gonna have to play with it depending upon the, uh, the temperature. An interesting thing about muriatic acid also is that it's what they use to cut rust and prepare a piece of metal for plating, for chrome or brass plating. If you get a chance to stop at some barn sale and you find some tools that are completely rusted shut, uh, I found a couple of pair of GE nippers that were in a coffee can. The coffee can still had water. They were non-functional. I put them in muriatic acid overnight, came back, gave them a little uh, chemical clean and brushed them off and you have virtually nice, perfectly working nippers. You can do that with old pliers that you find you get a deal on, overnight soaking and you come back and you've got a functional pair of pliers. Um, so muriatic acid has a, a lot of uses for us. Variety of handles that, that come uh, that you can buy. They got a, a bunch of these that are screw on handles. Uh, the Save Edge rasp are on the left. Those are the screw on ones. I like those because I've got three different colors. Uh, in my school, the blue handle is your floor rasp. Uh, the black or a white handle um, is going to be your finish rasp. And the red or black is going to be your hot rasp. Um, really quick to identify it. You can also use wooden handles that they have, uh, a little different shape for your finish rasp and your, and your floor rasp. They make a variety of drive-on handles. These are uh, uh, synthetic materials that you drive them on. They come in a variety of different colors. And once again, you can identify, identify your rasps. And for the fancy guys, they have uh, these really cool aluminum rasp handles that have set screws on them. You put these on the tang and screw them in. And uh, they got a good feel to them. Uh, some guys really like those. Uh, but it also it'll differentiate between your floor rasp and your finish rasp. They also make some little end covers. They make them out of a rubberized neoprene material and also the set screws. Uh, this gives you a little more, uh, I don't know, a little more control and power when you're pulling your rasp uh, across the foot. And uh, lots of folks like to put these on the end of the rasp in order to uh, get a little bit more control at pulling the rasp across the foot. With the advent of the um, barefoot craze, manufacturers have found out that professional farriers aren't necessarily the only ones trimming feet. But the amateur foot trimmer um, doesn't assume the shoeing position. They just like to pick it up and hold the foot with one hand. So they needed a one hand rasp. And they've come up with several different designs of rasps. Um, you can try them if you'd like. Uh, I've never had a lot of good luck with them, but you know how farriers are. We get we get in the habit of using what we like and, and we just doggedly stick with it. Uh, this is called the rider's rasp. It's got a replaceable uh, rasp insert for it. And as you can see, you can round up the, the edges um, comfortably by holding the foot with one hand and using the rasp with one hand. They also make a, a, a little mini flat rasp. It's got a, a comfortable uh, neoprene handle. Again, it's replaceable blade, and it's used just to uh, to round up the edges. This is called the rasp and go hoof rasp. Um, it's not meant to remove much foot, to change angles, to back up toes. It's just pretty much for just rounding off those uh, those edges. And we have a new addition coming, and I get to try this. I'm kind of excited to give it a whirl. It's called the boomerang rasp. Uh, if you haven't seen this, you can you can go online and see how they use it. You you grab those two little ears on each side, and you make a clockwise or counterclockwise motion. So it's not a back and forth motion, but it's an arc that you're doing. You so you take that rasp and you swing it around all the way past the heel, and then you grab the other side and swing it around and past the opposing heel in these counterclockwise and clockwise position. And uh, 
I'm just kind of curious to see if it gets rid of uh, dipping quarters for, for the new guys starting out. So it's going to be kind of fun to, uh, to see this boomer ass. If you don't like the chemical and you don't want to take time to buff it, uh, Save Edge has a rasp sharpening service that you can box your rasp up and send to. And here's the prices for Save Edge. And then they call they call all the other things off brands. So there's Save Edge brand and the off brands. And these are the prices that they have on them. These rasps come back virtually new, particularly if you've protected the rasp from metal. If the rasp has not been used on metal, or been banging against a lot of metal, they come back, and for seven dollars and thirty cents, you can you can have virtually a brand new rasp from this. Um, they like you to package them up tightly and and ship them to the Save Edge. Uh, make sure you include your business card or your name, return address, and phone number. Buy a case of rasp and save the box, and UPS them back to them in those, and uh, they ship them back as brand new rasps. When you're all uh, when you're all done with the rasp, what do you do? I just decided I just pick up some of the different types of knives that uh, that I've seen and and guys have made. They come by and grab uh, old rasps from us regularly. Um, they've got horn handles and wooden handles. These these rasps out of horseshoe rasps like this are more of a grinder smith and a blacksmith. They kind of grind these designs in. Uh, they got a, a couple of different handles you can epoxy on and and uh, they're if, if you have somebody that's using these and they're having trouble drilling holes for the handles, um, you just got to anneal the steel. You got to heat it up, let it cool, air cool overnight, and it'll get a little softer. And then you can temper the cutting edge, cutting edge later. Uh, um, spurs and hoof picks, uh, these are kind of common. Again, these are guys that uh, um, that are that are more grinder smiths. Uh, they use plasma plasma cutters and torches to cut this out and grind them up to clean them. Um, local guy can make stirrups out of the rasps and of course everybody's had a hand at the uh, at the traditional snake uh, that, that we like to have. I have a snake I put in my water bucket that the tail can hold the shoe so it can air cool if I don't want it to uh, quench it too fast. And they make uh, they make nice axes and, and a variety of other types of knives and stuff. Uh, so if you've got a, a blacksmith, uh, these guys pay a couple bucks per rasp for your used rasp. So keep them in, uh, and maybe advertise in Craigslist if you have some used rasp. But once again, when they ask you what the compound, what steel it's made out of, you don't know. Nobody knows. You can't find it. Nobody will tell you. They're just going to have to take uh, potluck. I do know that a save edge rasp, if you're going to make some Damascus steel, um, and I'm going to pick a horseshoe raft to use in making of Damascus. I'm definitely going with Save Edge. Um, they won't tell you what's in it, but it, it makes a sweet Damascus uh, uh, made uh, blade. And of course, a couple of little battle axes and stuff that they that they make. So thank you very much. I, I hope you got something out of this rasp. I'm prepared to take whatever question you guys would like. And I, once again, we're going to thank Save Edge for handing up the dollars to, to make this uh, this classroom live for you guys. And thank you very much. Great, thank you, Bob. We do have a few questions for you. Um, <clears throat> is there a specific type of uh, RASP that you recommend? Well, it, it's gonna depend on the environment. It, I live in uh, outside of Sacramento, California, and so um, uh, the Save Edge RASP is a really, really uh, sharp, rasp it's got eight teeth per row so it works very very well in dry environments uh, and I'm fond of that uh, in a wetter environments uh, it might clog up and you might have to brush it a little bit more so going to six teeth might be might be a little bit better uh, but um, I've used Save Edge uh, for quite a few years and and I've enjoyed the rasp okay um how often can you reuse muriatic acid? It starts to dilute, particularly if you have it uh, uh, out in the air. That's why I put a cap on it. I can get, oh, I probably get 15, 16 rasps out of that little tube of muriatic acid. It takes a little bit longer each time. Um, and, and you'll be able to see that when it's time to change. 
And to change it, you dump the muriatic acid into just a bucket, a plastic bucket, a paint bucket, and then you just put a hose in there and just let it overflow and dilute. Uh, it goes right into the ground, and if you've got acid-loving plants, you got a bonus. Now, you mentioned earlier that uh, rasps and metal don't work real well, so should uh, Ferry use the magnet on the, on the uh, huff stands? Well, you know, that, that, that has a tendency to, uh, on the hoof stand, that tendency to dull your rasp when you slap that thing on it. I'm, I'm not an advocate of it. Um, I prefer to, to, to have a trim box or a shoeing box right there that I've got a sleeve that my rasp goes in. Um, even if I'm out just doing trims, I want to keep that thing in the sleeve. And you can, you can mount a piece of uh, a PVC pipe just to hold that rasp on those stands. Uh, just drill a big hole on one side and a little hole on the other side and just screw in a, uh, a couple of screws to keep it from tilting. And you've got the same thing as a magnet, but, but you're, not, uh, you're not tearing up the teeth. You touched on um, it earlier regarding the uh, compound, um, but uh, what, what type of compound do you use and what type of uh, <clears throat> buffing wheel would you recommend when sharpening rasps? Well, that article that Steve's got, he's got, uh, he's got his brand, it's a liquid. Uh, I use a jeweler's rouge, and I, I just take some of those, uh, oh, they're not quite uh, a half an inch, but I'll, uh, cotton, uh, and I'll put four of those together, and that'll give me the width to be able to clean up my rasp, and I go with a, a jeweler's rouge. They, they have uh, um, a black jeweler's rouge, it's a little bit coarse, and then they have a white for a little bit fine. Um, I find that the course works really well on the rasps, and uh, that's all I have to do with it. Okay. Now, um, what concentration do you recommend for the baking soda? Oh gosh, I you know I uh, I do that like I cook. I just kind of throw it in the, the it the the water. Most everybody's water is uh, is kind of a base, and so with enough water to dilute that, um, I would take a for one rasp, uh, I would take a bucket of water and throw a little handful in. That, that's all you really need. Okay. And we have a few uh, owners, horse owners, uh, viewing tonight. And uh, <clears throat> we had one who was wondering, what what's dipping a quarter? Uh, dipping the quarter is when you're trying to level a horse's foot. The quarters are on both sides, and they're much thinner. And using a traditional horseshoeing rasp, if you go side to side, you'll have a tendency to pull a lot of material out so that the foot is uh, not, not flat. So you wouldn't have a good marriage between your, your shoe and, uh, and the horse's foot. You'd have little gaps, kind of like the old four-point trims where they wanted you to dip the quarters. That means you'd want to gut those out a little bit so they wouldn't have contact with the ground or with the shoe. Great. That's all of the questions that we have. We want to thank Bob Smith and Save Edge uh, for doing this tonight. We really appreciate it. Again, you can learn more about Save Edge products at saveedge.com. If you miss any of this webinar or would like to rewatch it, please visit americanfarriers.com after uh, 7 p.m. tomorrow, and you'll be able to watch the video there. Before I, I leave, I'd like to thank each of you for attending and being a part of this webinar. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I hope you uh, to see you here next time for our next session. And whether you read the magazine, visit our website, or follow us on Facebook, we'll be sure to share that information with you. And with that, I say have a good night.